Hey, Bob. Uh, Bob says, nice piano beginning. Uh, it is nice if it only happens once in a while. <laughs> for me, it is like I have to bear this uh, for many hours throughout the day. My neighbor. Too much of a good thing is also is, is not good, right? So that's what uh, my relationship with piano is. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Hey guys, uh, not too much to talk today. Uh, so, so the Thanksgiving week, so it's gonna hey. be a random hey. ramblings today on various topics. I, I'm not even, you know, mostly about us, us trying to learn from each other. Vivek. No spe specific topic today. Yeah, yes, yeah, Sam. <clears throat> I just found out today that. Uh... Amazon is charging me, uh, I think, sugar tax on my non-sugared soft drinks. Uh, the, uh, the third line manager refused to uh, or has no access to delineate the tax, the sales taxes that is, are being charged to my account. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. I don't know. So back in 2017, I went to Safeway in San Francisco to buy a Diet Coke. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I had a sugar tax. So then I went to the Department of Equalization and I said, this has no sugar in it. Why does it have a sugar tax? Well, uh, this is the San Francisco Department of Equalization. And they said, uh, well, uh, uh, no answer. But the next year, uh, they took away the sugar tax. Oh, okay. So what ha what's going on here is, um, well, the third level, the third high uh, from the bottom manager in the Bahamas, she can't help me. So I got to dig further because, I mean, to delineate my taxes. Because I got charged $3.30.40 for $12 of taxable items. I, wow. I don't believe soft drinks is taxable, especially if it has no sugar. Hmm. Interesting. I I, I didn't know that. So, uh, so uh, w what caused me to look into it was last night. There was a you know one of these uh, uh, these uh, stupid articles that says, "Oh, Amazon is causing everything to be overpriced," and I thought, "Well, I don't think that's true." You know, they have the market. But so then today I got very suspicious about you know I looked further into my taxes and then which was three thirty seven and you know I've been purchasing for them from them for two years soft drinks so uh, I decided to go further. Well, that that's some investigative journalism on your part. Well, <laughs> you know, save money, you know, and you know if uh, Amazon's pocketing something or the government's pocketing leash look i got no handouts okay yeah true yeah even if i did get a handout i'd still be pissed off but i got no handouts and you know i mean most of my chinese neighbors shanghai neighbors didn't get handouts most of my hong kong neighbors didn't get handouts oh actually it's interesting in hong kong hong cantonese chinese people get uh, uh handouts for retail but not uh, foreign Hong Kong residents. Yeah, some politics over there, which I have no idea how that works. Oh, well, I'm just saying how uh, unfair it is. Oh, and yesterday, uh, I went to a muni office uh, at, uh, you know, by B of A at a market in uh, Van Ness, and it was closed. Um, it has a sign, we are closed for federal holidays. Well, yesterday was not a federal holiday, so I went there twice, and it was closed both times. And um, that street corner is kind of disgusting. You know, San Francisco is kind of uh, disgusting. But, you know, the thing was, you know, they should have been open, and why aren't they open, you know? When I worked, uh, we had to show up, and maybe we had half a day, but still, I mean... You had to show up. Yeah, I mean, for the day after thing or whenever you're supposed to, but they have a clear sign, closed for federal holidays. 
Uh, so hopefully I got got you on. Thank you for letting me rant. Okay, later. Cool. Uh, I see another comment of new photo is cool. Work from home. Yeah, I mean, we've been working from home. I do tend to go to office um, at least three times uh, a week, if not three, at least twice a week. But uh, no specific restrictions, right? No, no specific ask. Like there's no mandate from company that we have to be in office. It just feels good to get out of home. And like, you know, it's, you can still, even though we're working from home for now almost three years, you know, since the onset of COVID, uh, but I still feel in-person meetings are way more productive than you know, uh, then Zoom meetings uh, or the, the spontaneous discussions that you can have with colleagues. That's just not possible with Zoom plus, plus Slack, plus whatever other technologies that we have. Uh, that whole spatial uh, recognition is it, just not there. So, so it, is, it, it, is, it is fun. Uh, out of sight, out of mind, you're not visible to management and all the good things you do. True. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it, hybrid is going to stay. I don't think everyone will move to in, in person. But if there is an opportunity, you know, I do want to take advantage and, and go and meet people in person. It's a, it's a different feeling. It's a different feeling. And of course, it feel good to get out of... Uh, your own small den that you know you're stuck in for at least eight hours a day. Cool. All right. Any other new uh, Thanksgiving stories to share? Anyone went out for shopping? Black Friday seems to be muted. Uh, I don't know. I didn't look at uh, much around. No shopping for me. Uh, we just met with you know, friends and families, that's all we did on, on Thanksgiving. No Black Fridays for me. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm there's sure. always discounts throughout the year. So Black Friday can't have a lost charm for me unless someone has to buy really a big ticket item. It's uh, so crowded. I, I, mean, I don't know. Maybe it still is. Yeah. Uh, okay. I was trying to go to CVS to yesterday because there's a special on uh, Starbucks uh, coffee. Uh, well, we didn't have it. It was a store within a store, hmm. but at least Target was open at eight, eight o'clock. But the thing was, I had no idea that they had sales that day because there was no flyer. Yeah, I, w I went to Best Buy. Best Buy was a mess, like it usually is. And then I went to Whole Foods, and Whole Foods had had no flyer, so uh, actually the. The only place that was busy was Costco. Uh, oh, okay. Just normally it's busy as Costco. Yeah, Costco is. is normally busy. So so I'm going to talk about Costco a little bit. Uh, today, I think we have something to talk from across. Like I said, today's topic is appropriate of nothing. So there is, the, I'm not going to go through our normal schedule of macro and all that stuff. It's way more open discussion. I do want to do one episode maybe per year where it's uh, quite wide open for discussions. We'll, we can pick topic from anywhere when it comes to any type of investing. So, so all is uh, all is game for today. All right, uh, so let's uh, dive into today's uh, session and uh, let's get going. <clears throat> all right, <clears throat> so yeah, first of all, let's start. I do want to start with my thoughts around uh, Thanking you all, thanking this uh, community, thanking the community of our retail investors for being here every week. It's fun to talk. It's fun to engage. And uh, investing is, is, is hard and it's boring, right? Unfortunately, I think in 2020, 2021, uh, we made investing as really interesting really you know sugar rush and now you're feeling the effect of that sugar rush waning down right now is seeing the the impact of um, 
or, or in the market because it's just really so interesting. Stocks going up five percent, ten percent, spacs and all that stuff. General good investing is is boring, so it's good to be part of a community so that we can talk to each other, bounce ideas. Uh, you know, do you have a questions? I go and research for it. Uh, so, so thank you uh, to to you all. Bob, no shopping for us too. Yeah, for parts of we also give up shopping. Thankful, uh, we are thankful for you. Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate this. Thank for knowledge about option trading. Not any particular stock. Welcome, Ramesh. Uh, welcome. So, so now I have a I have a question for you. Is uh, in twenty twenty two. What stock are you most thankful for? Right. And this, you, the 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 easiest way is to look at okay, which stock returned the had the best returns in twenty twenty two, or the least worst return in twenty twenty two. That's one way to look at. Um, or you could say maybe it's not the return, but maybe. I learned a lot when I got myself you know, associated with this particular stock. Maybe that helped me become a better investor or helped me learning something new. Or it might be just joy of owning that stock that you have owned for, for years. And uh, you, know, you, you love to have that stock in your portfolio. So things root and uh, let's talk about what stock are you most thankful for and why? Meanwhile, I'll read some comments. Uh, Steve say closed all position, lost to treasury this year, waiting for VIX to go around 30. Uh, so I hope when you say closed all position, closed all your options uh, position. Lost to treasury this year. I think it, 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 you're not the only one. I guess most of the Wall Street and hedge funds have also lost to, to plain old just cash sitting in the bank. But it's just one year. Overall, in the long term, stocks still does, does great. So yeah, let your ideas flow in. Which are the stocks that you feel you are thankful for and why? So I got two and phase energy and uh ASML. So why M phase? You want to talk through it? Feel free. So it's saying N phase energy is what you're thankful for. Uh, why? Anyone else uh, want to share what's the stock we are most thankful for? So I'll start uh, with mine. So the, we got something common common here. Uh, for me, it's uh, ASML. So I'll say multiply by two. For me, the reason I'm thankful for ASML is uh, this was the first talk that I started looking at. It got me interested into semiconductor industry as such. It helped me understand because I wanted to get involved in this stock, it helped me understand how the semiconductor supply chain works, which are the different players in semiconductor. This was a new industry that I had never, I was never involved with. So it opened my eyes to the, the, all the complexities that goes around in creating a semiconductor and helped me appreciate why we went through what we went through around, you know, whole chip, um a shortage and why it is not easy to get around that problem really quickly right it helps me to understand why us is now suddenly becoming so you know why us is so friendly with taiwan and why we're very cautious and have our navy you know in the in that sea trying to protect taiwan so so i'm thankful just for this year to to under to ASML for initiating me into a completely new industry, you know, and then started looking at 
of course the other players in the same industry so that's for me it's a uh, it's asml and the other thing which i'm thankful for this year is uh does the hedging trades which is mostly almost i think uh, e either the short calls or the short call spreads on indices right uh, for for the reasons because those are the things that have uh, helped uh, keep me keep me alive in the market keep me interested in the market uh, long stocks growth stocks have all been beaten down you know things that can still keep you interested still keep you um, active and uh, help you or help me to stay in the market are a lot of these hedge trades so those are i would say that the best performing returns uh, for 2022 <clears throat> those are two things Anyone else have any stocks that you are thankful for? Some stock that might have paid you learn some new things. And phase invested in June 20 has 120% gain. Trading options alone. Yeah. So for me, ASML is not yet overall not yet profitable uh because i've been i picked up asml at 300 also at 800 all the way so now it's come back down but it's, this is a stock that once you get your skin in the game it, and this is one of the stock once i got my skin in the game and uh, uh it helped me to understand an entirely new industry my guess for the stock to fall is apple um why do you think so is it the covid policy or is it you're thinking hmm maybe um their whole iphone magic is now not not working anymore i'll be cautious around apple because there are so many other ways to to prop up the stock right if nothing else is still a dividend paying company they also continue to buy back a lot of their shares and increase the eps so when it comes to apple there are they have their tentacles and there are so many options to help um to help the stock if not iphone 14 there's they have a services revenue and uh, now the latest one is uh, their advertising revenue right? so but uh, I think Apple, Apple at least they closed this week. It it, it wasn't a it dragged down uh, Dow this week. But I won't bet against Apple. Apple is my I think top holdings. Uh, this is a stock which is in green. But so I'm not going to bet against Apple. All right, so uh, let's uh, see what else. A anyone else have any stocks that you feel is going to either fall through or you think that's uh, that's going to do good in near future or, a or any of your favorite? Okay, a uh, 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 Kramer inverse ETF gift that keeps on giving. That is true. <laughs> uh, where did I think I had uh, somewhere I saw that meme is one thing which always work is Kramer's inverse ETF. Uh, actually, there is a there is a there was a filing done for an ETF for Kramer's uh, in. Did it actually start a trading? Kramer. What's a ETF? And I want to see is it actually starting trading? Jim Kramer inverse ETF. Uh, okay, as as Jim or short Jim, long Jim. Does it even trade? 
Very interesting to see what's the, uh, not yet. As Jim. Okay, not yet. It'll be interesting to see what, what this uh, sh short uh, Jim Kramer has. Steve says, Apple has supply chain cost issues. iPhone is more of a commodity, but I think iPhone 14 is, there's still demand for it. Yeah, the the, the growth story for Apple is not iPhone. I think that the growth story is going beyond iPhone. And that is, I don't want to bet against Apple because they will come up with something new, which the rest of the world would want. And that's what they've been doing, right? Services was the new one. Now I'm listening. I'm seeing how their advertising revenue, which let's say five years ago, was uh, 400 million, 500 million dollars only, and uh, in this year it's already four billion dollar, and projected to grow to you know some 15, 20 billion dollar in four or five years. So they have a um, variety. Apple, even though on the devices, they're not been innovating a lot after Steve Jobs, but they are looking for other ways to, to make, to still make money, right? And we'll only get to know once we start, you know, looking under the hood of how Apple is making money. Of course, supply chain issues, definitely right now. I think Foxconn, there was some labor unrest and then Foxconn had to pay additional some some wages. I don't know what the whole story is. I just looked at a headline, but there were some issues. But and uh, now they're moving, trying to move their supply chain outside of China to reduce the dependency and move more towards. Uh, I think India is going to be the beneficiary uh, of that. So, but we'll see. Uh, app store cut will come down big time yeah 30 percent tax i think there are many companies that are doing going to regulators across the world around this this uh additional apple tax sure i mean they but uh yeah i'm, I'm uh, we'll see yeah. i think may not be a growth story apple may not stay as a growth story but right now there's so much of a cash dividend and uh in the consumer brand that i am not willing to bet against apple okay uh wix reaching 30 is less likely hmm no no i mean wix has been was kind of a decimated yeah it's now almost to the to the very VIX always find a very strong support near 19. So now it's closer to its uh, to its support level. Let's see if it goes up from here or what what happens. Generally, end of if we have a Santa Claus rally, so we should expect to see VIX VIX going even lower uh, than this. But given some of the COVID concerns in China. And what I heard is they had their maximum number reported in uh, since this year, I guess, some more than 30,000 new COVID cases in China. And uh, officially, they are not on lockdowns, those strict lockdowns, but I think unofficially, uh, there are lockdowns happening across China again. So too many variables in, in the market to to see where VIX will go. But uh, this this year, uh, pretty happy with VIX staying above 20, you know, for most of the time, uh, some rich option premium throughout the year. So make hay while the sun shines. So it's a good option. Uh, I would say good option trades and good option premium this year. Won't, won't stay the same. Uh, you know, for, for long. <clears throat> okay, so last week, uh, I think someone asked me about the podcast. So uh, let me share what podcast, you know, do I have and I'll tell you why I have each one of them, right? 
So no, this this is no preference order. It was just I could grab the screenshot in whichever way, and I was just listing it down, right? So the one uh, this is CoinDesk Podcast Network. Those who are interested around the crypto side, CoinDesk is uh, uh, they they have a newsletter plus they run some live TV shows, etc. So they have a podcast. It's just give you a quick roundup of what's happening on the crypto. What's a you know the the main the big stories of crypto for a day right they they have episode 15 20 minutes uh, other one which i listen to is Motley fool money um again this gives a rundown around the around the business uh, some good thoughts around investing you know um what has happened let's say it, and this is also a daily podcast what happens in the market a quick review short-term as well as long-term impact let's say disney replaced its uh, ceo right what happened why did they do it so some of those uh, market comment not the stock price commentary not the market uh where the market is not where the spx is not related to that but more around business so i like motley for for that uh Next one is Option Insider Radio. This is kind of an umbrella podcast. And within uh, uh, the under the ages of Options Insider Radio, there are other podcasts like uh, Volatility. Uh, I forgot the name. So they have, um, uh, within a week, they also have a, the This Week in Futures and Volatility, one episode related to that. They also started doing crypto rundowns. In 2020 or 2021, uh, not much interested in that one. Uh, then they have their uh, option block. Um, so this is where you get to see and hear about mostly professional uh, options uh, traders on what they are doing, what they think about the market, how they want to position in um and some and one of the episodes they always talk about if you want to do X, then what's an option strategy that you could use? And they use right? um, also talk about uh, what are the common mistakes that retail uh, of you know investors do when dealing with options, and they also answer questions from uh, uh, from retail investors. I think in one of the episodes uh, in the week, so. Yeah, so I uh, I use options insider radio to just you know for a lot of our own for uh, for option stuff. Okay, um, anyone have these? So do let me know if anyone of you also have these uh, podcasts on your phone. Will we see if uh, you know? Am I the only crazy guy <laughs> listening to these podcasts, or do I have some company here? Yeah. Uh, are the subscription based one so all these which i'm giving you have to pay zero dollars all of them are free you can just download it uh, from you know google podcast or apple podcast all of them are free uh next is a business breakdown this is from Colossus investments uh, they do a good job of picking up one business and as the name suggests breaking it down Right. It's a break. It's not. They don't talk about anything about the stocks or you know what's happening in the short term, long term. It's all about their business model. It's all about you know how that business makes money. It's all about the history of the business. What's the competitive edge? Why it's this one? You know. So it's it's basically if you were to understand about any company. Uh, you know, it's it's a good podcast. So the recent one, which I was listening to yesterday while I was doing some work in, uh, you know, it's a little bit of cleanup because yesterday we had some friends coming to my place. I was doing a lot of a cleanup in the house and uh, spent more than an hour listening to uh, Brookfield Asset Management. And it's a, this is a company that we generally don't talk about. That's a company which is on alternative investments. It's just like BlackRock is, but it's, uh, you know, lesser known name, Brookfield Asset Management. And uh, so there they were talking about the, the, how the company started, 
how you know how they manage the company the businesses the portfolio the different um uh, businesses that they are in their venture capital business their real estate business what they're doing on india and all that stuff so i love this business breakdown to get into the detail of if i am interested in a stock and if they have that business breakdown episode on that stock it will give you much more information around around how the business actually works okay. mr says i listen to baron's podcasts okay something else to add i don't have baron's podcast on my uh on my phone <clears throat> Okay, uh, next one, uh, Wall Street Journal. You know, this is very quick and light. It is, it's not intense, but uh, it does. Uh, and this is also, it's, um, it's a very sh short podcast. Generally, it'll be five minutes, seven minutes. So we're going to go, you know, you've got to go for, so if you don't have much time and, uh, and, and you want to quickly listen to something. And it generally... J.R. Villan, uh, who is a host, he'll pick out one particular topic and uh, invite a you know fellow journalist to to talk about it. Um, and uh, I think I forgot the recent one was on. Uh, so, for example, they'll talk about okay how the student loan forgiveness program, right? How you can take advantage of that, or uh, you know with a real increase in the market so they always pick a very contemporary topic and uh, get into the detail of topic how a common you know investor or how a everyday um, john and jane can make use of uh any of this financial uh, dues or changes that are happening so so i like that but it's a very small uh next one is uh tip um it is from the investing investors podcast um and uh, from it's called we study billionaires the reason i like this is uh, they invite some of the seasoned either you know hedge fund managers investment managers and they once a week they also have an episode on on crypto economy side mostly centered around bitcoin um so you you get to hear uh, the the thought process sometimes it's at uh, microeconomic level sometimes they're at a macro side on and and hear how those successful investors when i say successful investors most of the guests that they have are long term successful investors right say so howard marks the most recent one was uh, the the one that they published was uh, from um, manish pabrai uh, manish pabrai is a canadian uh, investor and uh, he was talking about his philosophy of of managing investments and all that so so it's good to hear a different perspective around uh, around investing and this is mostly focused on long term investing sometimes they also do a book review of uh, you know uh, of some in let's say i don't know which i forgot who is uh, what of uh, was it howard marks book or was it someone else's book so they'll also do you know the principles or howard marks or stuff like that <clears throat> so that's uh, I like that. Uh, next one is macro voices. As the name suggests, this is really, really on a very at a macroeconomic level. Not no individual stocks. What's happening uh, global at a macro side? Good if you're uh, invested in uh, energy. They do talk a lot about energy uh, uh, sector, uh, but this is more. Uh, again, this is host, uh, hosted by uh, hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. um good to get some uh, info at a metro level right right side is the journal uh, whatever is an interesting story in the wall street they'll pick up something and talk about it next one is all in 
sorry if it is boring. I'll just, I just want to go through it, uh, share in terms of where I get some of my information from. Uh, next is All In, uh, which is basically run by four friends and uh, VCs, Jamal, Jason Kalakhanigas, uh, David Sachs, David uh, Friedberg. This gives a little more thought process into what's happening with the VC from how the VC people think through, right? It's, it's a different, when it comes to the VC, when it comes to retail investors, our objectives are different and uh, our investment philosophies are different and the way the vcs look at the investments and the way we look at investments and uh, it has to be different so if we are seeing and i do see many retail investors go trying to become a vc overnight right i want to in, in you know invest in this through syndicate my because my friend or someone i i work with is saying there's a great um, investment, uh, VC looks interesting because you talk about 50 times, 100 times gains, but the mindset of why VC is investing and why we invest is completely different. So it's a good to hear VC perspectives on, on the market, on how company operates. Uh, and, uh, and they also bring up, you know, sometimes uh, I think it's David Friedberg who is very interested in, in the science. So we'll talk about some times we'll bring about uh, some revolution happening around on, on the science side. So it's a good, it's a fun uh, uh, and uh, it's not a very serious podcast, but it's a good insight into, into the VC mindset. Uh, next one on the right side, this one is a tea boy. It used to be called Robin Hood Snacks uh, run by two friends. And the Robinhood had uh, basically bought their company or and then they converted it to the Robinhood Snacks. After Robinhood got into troubles <laughs> over the last few years, they, they probably divested. And now they, they have to change their name from Robinhood Snacks to, because now they are no longer part of Robinhood. It became T-Boy, which is the best one yet. So they start talk about every episode is the best one yet. Oh, actually, yeah, that's what they... Uh, it's mentioned. So it's a uh, what they do is do it's basically it's a daily podcast and we'll pick up three topics on uh, whichever is the you know those three topics of the day. So sometimes if when I bring up some of the information, okay, this is what I heard about a particular company, and one of them may be coming from T Boy. So it's give you a quick rundown on let's say this week it was what disney got a new ceo and i don't know i'm not listening to what they have done this week so but it's a they'll pick up three topics and then they'll talk about it okay uh next one is unchained unchained is again those who are interested on the crypto economy side it's run by one of i would say the most respected crypto journalist laura shin she was the first mainstream journalist to delve into crypto economy and then uh, she was from forbes and then later on she quit forbes and uh, became an uh, entrepreneur running her podcast newsletter and recently she also wrote a book which actually i bought and I'm currently reading uh, the whole history behind the whole Ethereum and how it started and all that stuff. Uh, so uh, I learned a lot about this ecosystem from uh, from the, this podcast. But now over the years, it has also changed. Now they also invite four uh, VCs um, to talk about you know the the latest happenings and. So they invite uh, VC of Dragon Capital. There are there are four uh, VC or hedge fund managers in the crypto space uh, who also come and talk about the latest ones, the, the stuff are happening on crypto, give their perspective, why this FTX blew up. Right? Most of the time, mainstream media has no idea because they don't understand it. So there you get into the details of the shenanigans that's being played by, you know, uh, let's say FTX or Terra Luna or whatever blew up, or if there is a good things happening, get to get to hear from from the insiders uh, over there. 
Oh, the right hand side, the next one, I was a the disciplined investor uh, podcast. This is the one which um, you would call someone as. Uh, uh, so, so this is run by, uh, I forgot the name. <clears throat> but anyway, so he's uh, uh, is a registered investment advisor, RIA. And so he's uh, uh, basically talks about his thoughts on what happened in this week. This is once a week. It generally comes out on uh, I think Saturdays or Sundays, so it's good for my evening walk. It's around an hour of an episode. It's a once a week uh, and give its own perspective of you know what's happening on the market and uh, you know um, as a registered investment advisor, you know how he would view and uh, uh, you know advise his clients on that, right? Uh, next other pad podcast is 6.5 podcast. Uh, this is, I would say, one of the recent ones, uh, 6.5 this week in startups. And the reason I have 6.5 is it's a very niche podcast. It's uh, run by um, uh, uh, Moorhead, Patrick Moorhead. I forgot the name of the other person. But these, are, these two gentlemen are, are respected what do you call them? Analysts? I mean, these are, so industry analysts, not, not the, let's say, Wall Street analysts, but these gentlemen are, uh, they they were, uh, let's say, operator, owner, or, or, a, or a employee who has spent years in technology companies like AMDs and HPs. So 6.5 podcast is mostly around that industry. And it uh, gives you insight on, let's say, AWS reInvent, which is going to happen. They'll give you a gist of what did Microsoft announce, what did HP announce, what was Amazon doing, uh, you know, Qualcomm, what is Qualcomm doing right now, mostly around tech related to hardware and software combinations, right? Uh, Microsoft, when the top of Microsoft, what's happening to Microsoft? Surface, Duo, you know, uh, AWS, uh, HP, stuff like HP Greenlight, their um, new uh, initiative around the cloud. I wasn't even aware until I, you know, heard it on 6.5 podcast. I'm like, what the heck is this? I never knew about it. What's this Greenlight initiative? So a little different uh, than what you see on the, on the you know, get covered on, on the mainstream, let's say CNBC, et cetera. So they give a different perspective. Um, on these hardware companies, and they talk about uh, you know what what what's happening on on those ones. And if there's a these conferences happening, that will give you just of which company announced what in those conferences. So this is around 30, 35 minutes. Cover six topics, six companies each five minutes. It never happens the same way, but you, know, you, you get an idea. All right, uh, next one which I have is This Week in Startups, run by Jason. Um, and uh, uh, this generally talks about the startups, but nowadays in the recent times, I hear Jason talking more and more about the market, what's happening with the market uh, specifically. So if it's a Twitter is the news, he'll spend time on talking Twitter. If, uh, if the FTX is in the news, talk about FTX. Right now, there are layoffs happening, and they'll say why these layoffs are happening, how companies blow themselves up, how as a VC they will go, and you know what they are telling to their uh, in uh, companies in which they have invested. So this is more focused on on the startups. And then they'll, they will also invite then the, um, a startup uh, business owner, CEO of a startup, to talk about their startup. Also talk about the the funding scenario in startup. Also talk about you know even in in uh, you know the the motivations of uh, of the VCs in funding the startup, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So so that's a I, mean, I I like listening to that. Uh, next one is uh, TechCrunch Equity. But again, all all these podcasts are are free. There are available and there's a like I only have these. I'm sure there are many other podcasts which have gone great uh, content. 
if you have something else, I noted Baron from uh, any other podcast that you're listening to, let's do share. Uh, TechCrunch Equity gives you a quick rundown on uh, the, the pre-public equity companies. And the, mostly they talk about this company got Series A, uh, you know, investment, Series B investment. And uh, I'll give a quick rundown on wh why, you know, they got it. And this is not run by VCs. This is mostly run by journalists or reporters uh, from TechCrunch. Uh, but sometimes gives you idea of where a lot of money is flowing into. Right. So I got to know about a clubhouse on this podcast. I also get to know, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, a startup uh, ecosystem being built uh, in India because there's a lot of funding moving to, uh, they're seeing a lot of new funding uh, going to startups in India. The as compared to, to many of the previous years. And last one I want to talk about is the bankless. <clears throat> That's a podcast which is focused specifically on the Ethereum ecosystem, right? So if you're interested in seeing what's happening on Ethereum ecosystem in terms of development, new projects, what else, uh, you know, that's an episode where you can get to know uh, what the Ethereum community is planning to do. Uh, one, so the stuff is... Uh, Sometimes they do go overboard in trying to project or push the agenda that Ethereum is the only um, you know, good project out there. And uh, uh, the host of these two, uh, I find they haven't had a, too much of experience in the real world. So you really have to be cautious when you're trying to base your decisions, investment decisions, I would say, especially on the bank and some of the posts are are pretty uh, thing. yeah again the coin desk because this space itself is new so let's say yesterday i was listening to the bank less and the way they were talking about gbtc i'm like you guys don't even know this no that's not who invest in gbtc are not the retail investors right so so yeah take it with a pinch of salt uh, i use them not to uh, uh, get their feedback on about the pricing or uh, or you know investing, but more around what's the new technological developments or innovations or plans of upgrade happening in the Ethereum ecosystem, new projects coming around Ethereum ecosystem. So that's why I use Bankless for that. Yeah, these are I would say covered most of the podcast that I listen to on I mean I have my phone it's not that I'm gonna go and listen to each and every of the episode so I'll for example macro voices I don't think I've heard it I listened to the last three four episodes at all all in is the one that I will definitely try to you know go through every episode it's a little bit fun they you know they joke with each other and uh and they pick up a contemporary topic. T by not every every topic. Again, unchain not every topic nowadays. Any of the most of the crypto podcasts over the last two three weeks have become boring for me because it's always the same topic of FTX. So I'm like, okay, I'm not getting into. Uh, I don't want to listen to FTX over and over again, right? So I'll wait once this drama dies down, and uh, yeah. This week in startups almost every week. This one I listen to every week. Option Insider, their option block, I listen to every week. Motley Fully almost every day. This one I listen to every day. So those are, I would say, my the podcasts. You know, the best thing about podcasts is you can listen to it either while you're driving to office, you're doing some yard work, you're cooking stuff in the kitchen, et cetera. So I, I that's why I like uh, listening to podcasts. From I say, I think I have seen Jason on CNBC as a contributor. Yeah, I think that they probably do call him. Uh, so Jason Callaghan has got his fame because of one of the earliest investors in Uber, right? 
you need that one good uh, and he made his millions hundreds of millions of dollars through his initial investment in uber he is also then he also invested in robin hood now he's also runs a startup university plus he has a what do you got a syndicate i i'm a part of that syndicate but i have not invested in any of the companies because if if you want to invest in as a vc as a company you should invest in at least 20 companies i don't have that much of a money to, right now for my vc investment that i can invest in 20 companies right so once i build up that portfolio then i'll start looking into the vcs but i'm a part of uh, uh what do you call that's the syndicate so you have to apply to he runs three or four syndicates you have to apply for it and then they'll approve it you become part of it so i do get proposals of some new uh, companies where uh, Jason and his team, you know, they have done their due diligence, the share, and you can actually jump onto the webcast to listen, to hear from uh, the CEO of those startups in case if you're interested in investing in startups. Like I said, VC investing is a different one. I want to have a capital to allocate to 20 startups, and that's when I will start. The success rate is, is very low. Right. <clears throat> uh, Steve, one of the podcasts I think uh, is good is Tasty Trade. Oh, great. But I don't have Tasty Trade on my phone. Uh, but I do listen to Tasty Trade on uh, on my you know laptop or, or, or computer. Um, those who, who've been around know most of my learning around options is through Tasty Trade. I'll be upfront. I'll be open. I mean, that's where I got my start on options in 2016 and i've been with tasty works right from day one whenever they started that brokerage firm because i i do want to pay my uh my fee education fee to them uh yeah but if you are interested in options want to do the right way tasty trade is a great website however i don't, i don't know about their podcast because i've never downloaded their podcast uh probably maybe i had the third earlier but uh, i don't know. but but it's, it's a great resource especially the confirm and send uh, let me just bring that up especially for so a few good things that you need to do if you want to taste your trade some of my favorite uh, topics are confirm and send wherein you know they'll answer a lot of uh, questions from uh, from listeners and again this is free the other one is uh, best practices or best practices of uh, your managing your trades rules for entry exit managing early you know and uh, you've seen me sharing a lot of their research right as a part of uh, you know what works in options what does not work in options uh, how you manage your encounters you know, understanding probability. So that's one. Options Jive is another one, which is my favorite. Uh, where is Options Jive? Uh, yeah, Options Jive is another my favorite. <clears throat> uh, next one is uh, Market Measures. So, yeah, this is the best resource for options at least from for, for me i owe all my learning to tasty trade good any other any other resource good resources of learning I heard barons. Oh, the, yeah. So let's, okay. This was related to podcasts, right? So let's talk about other than podcasts. What else? Uh, Bloomberg. I recently started, I subscribed to Bloomberg Business. Uh, I subscribed to Bloomberg. So I got Bloomberg Business uh, Week, access to Bloomberg Business Week. Oh, I'm pretty happy with that. I mean, the amount, the, I see the, so the, the content, especially, 
uh, some of the, the main topics that they pick up. They do The Bloomer does a really good job of getting into the details of that particular topic, right? But I've, it's only for a few months, and but I'm really enjoying reading through uh, Bloomberg Business, Business Week. Uh, Fidelity has a series of podcasts. Okay, let's... I think I listen to... Uh, for Fresh Invest. Oh, there's, there's a we heard Fidelity podcast series. Market Insights, Future Ready, FinPoint, Policy 360. Ooh. Okay, uh, let me just copy it, take, make a note of it. Any other podcasts? Uh, Bloomberg TV is free for E-Trade customer. They talk about European stocks. Actually, Bloomberg TV, I also, I think I get it for free because now I subscribe to Bloomberg. But uh, I think once or twice I tried on phone, they actually shows me eight advertisement. I had to go, before they actually start streaming the contents, I'm like, okay, I'm not watching Bloomberg TV because of uh, uh, TD Ameritrade account. I get uh, CNBC free for me. So if it's something running at the background is generally CNBC. But I think I do want to do Bloomberg, but they show seven or eight ads before they show the content. And that's, that's a pain to get through it. So I haven't warmed up to Bloomberg TV yet. Because uh, like I said, I only very recently, I subscribed to Bloomberg. Not the Bloomberg terminal, but the Bloomberg.com. So, but what I'm liking, I, I do like reading their uh, weekly uh, magazine. All righty. Uh, so that's around the podcast. So so thank you. I'll, I'll look into Fidelity. I've never looked into Fidelity uh, podcasts. Cool. Anything else to share? The learning resources, uh, as you all know, I do have a FinViz. Um, trading view 50%, is there a FinViz discount? Uh, and a stock rover, stock chart markets, uh, they all have Black Friday deals. All right, uh, continuing learning, let's learn from one of our best investors. The Macro Compass is a pretty neat newsletter and podcast, The Macro Compass. Cool. I'll take a note of it. And uh, yeah, and see. I mean, given the amount of time, you can't do all. But the good idea is, it's uh, I would want to see, you know, and then listen to a few of uh, episodes before deciding you know, if you want to continue or not. It's going paid next year. Then it is out. <laughs> for me, then it is out. Uh, cool. <clears throat> All right. Uh, uh, okay, we can come to the investing quotes later. That's, oops. Should I mean? You weekly YouTube analysis of the market. Uh, let's be here, share something. Clovaco Capital.
Oh no. Oh, not L. Sure. The rock of capital is so I. Cool. Thank you, SP. Yeah, I, again, I think all of them are right. You just have to get comfortable uh, with with one of them to, when you're listening in and then, you know, just stick to that. So, so over the over years, I started listening to these and for now, you know, these are the ones. I ha also had some point of a time, I also had some podcasts from E-Trade. I didn't like it, deleted that. I also had... Uh, Anthony Pompliano's when he was actually bringing in the guest to talk about uh, the ecosystem. Uh, deleted that later on because ever since the winter set in, he doesn't bring up uh, the crypto, the guest to talk about crypto ecosystem. So that was, so I deleted that. Uh, yeah, so I've circled through and these may not be the final ones, you know, as and when I find something new, like business, business breakdown was a new one. I discovered while I was listening to something else. And in that podcast, they talked about business breakdown. I'm like, what? Okay, let me go and pick up business breakdown. And uh, one of the business breakdown was about Uber. Right. So in one of our previous sessions, I talked about the details of Uber. It came through, through almost 90, it was 90, even it was two hour long episode of the whole details about Uber. Right. So that's where then I came and shared it, uh, it in one of the sessions. So, yeah, and then I liked it the way they 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 dissect the company. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna keep that. All right. Uh, other stuff. Uh, I came through this uh, around the Costco's business model. Sounds interesting. Thought I'll share. Uh, I found it interesting. Costco is the world's third largest retailers. Right, uh, almost two hundred billion dollar in sales, and it's all about value and uses many psychological hacks to telegraph that concept of value. Right, it all starts with membership. At Costco, the membership, you know, they make most. This is the most profitable business unit of Costco is their membership. Right, and they have a different levels of membership. One hundred and twenty dollar is executive membership. And uh, for for Costco members, that membership is you know gives you incredible value, right? Uh, in its last reporting, membership were two percent of revenue, but seventy percent of the profits. It's a huge profit spinner for uh, Costco uh, uh, for 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 the customers to renew their membership. And uh, they have over 90% renewal rate, which is great, right? And this is the most profitable segment for Costco to make money. So in early 2000, Costco CEO Jim Senegal told Jeff Bezos, who would roll out Prime, that membership fee is one-time pain, but the value of the concept is reinforced every time customers see 47-inch TV that are 200 less than any place else. Further, Costco's 110 million plus members are hit by sunk cost fallacy. Hey, I already spent money on this one, so I'll go and try to recover some by buying over there, right? People will spend more time and money on something if they've already made an investment, right? So is a sunk cost fallacy is the same stuff even in the stock market, right? Well, I think there is somewhere where I'll talk about it. Uh, they have a 90% renewal rate and members seem to be okay with the deal. Now I'm seeing the same stuff on the prime. It, uh, second is a bare bones appearance. Costco has 800 plus warehouse. They have a minimalist interior that screams value. Uh, white small square exposed beams. No, this one exposed beams, concrete flooring, used card boxes as checkout bags. It feels like a wholesale venue filled with deals versus standard retail. And the deals are actually the best. Costco aims for pricing authority. 
which means consistently providing the most competitive prices across the best products. Cost, at least my experience is Costco will not have the cheapest, um, the the cheapest product in a you know in in a particular line, but they have the best value. So if you want to buy a laptop, you won't get a let's say a six hundred dollar lab. You won't get a lower configuration cheapest laptop. You get a higher configuration cheapest laptop. You know where you can buy anywhere else. So sometimes you end up buying either the laptop. Let's say, or if you're buying a cameras, I don't know if any people now buy cameras, but those days when you used to buy cameras, they'll they'll pack up the DSLR with two lenses, right? Even though you may not need two, right? You may, if you just need one, you could buy a DSLR camera with one lens somewhere outside cheaper. But if you bundle in another separate lens, you bundle in some memory cards, you bundle in a bag, camera bag, and you bundle in a stand, and you bundle in a few filters, all that bundle, you can't find anywhere else cheaper than Costco. Right? Uh, so from that perspective, they bundle the stuff and make the deal as the best. I negotiate hard with suppliers and caps markups to 15%. Uh, Kirkland Signature is a white label arm. Uh, so this is pretty common. All the retailers want to promote their white labels because those are very profitable. And uh, it does $40 billion in sales. Right? And it contracts the same suppliers it already stocks to make Kirkland brand. At the end of the day, it's, it's a more of a branding uh, exercise. Uh, no paradox of choice. It simplifies decision making with only one or two choices per product. Right? Uh, you're not you're not faced with twenty different brands of a particular stuff. In Costco, in total, Costco stocks only three thousand SKUs versus thirty thousand SKUs for a typical stock market. Right? No analysis paralysis. The product mostly come in bulk which communicates value and has per unit prices to calculate savings. Uh, uh, free samples. It's not exclusive to Costco, but no place is better known for its near, less, near limitless free samples. The psychology is simple, reciprocity. Uh, reciprocity, people compelled to buy a product in return for receiving something for free. If you like that sample a little bit, you probably end up picking it up, even though it wasn't on your shopping list to begin with when you entered Costco. And you go for one thing or two things, uh, and you never come back, come out of a Costco with two things. Uh, lastly is $1.50 hard dog combo. Uh, it has kept its hard dog combo price to $1.50 since 1985. That's amazing. To keep the price low, it had to build its own hot dog plant. It has also built a chicken plant to keep the rotisserie price, the rotisserie chicken price at $5. The food court is typically the last thing you see before leaving. So the $1.50 deal is seared in your brain. Legendary Costco founder Jim Senegal asked by incoming CEO about the hot dog deal. And he said, if you raise prices, I'll fucking kill you. So I mean, there's a lot of stories around Costco's dollar fifty hot dog. You know, doesn't matter where the inflation is, they'll they never raised uh, the price of of that hot dog. I think I recently heard that uh, Sam's Club has cheaper hot dog. Maybe this week, or there are some some news about again some of these are wholesale chain on uh, some hot dog right, so, that, so that's uh that's what costco that's their business model plain and simple they don't go behind hundreds and thousands of items focused on limited number of items negotiate with the supplier you are sure that you cannot you cannot get the same package at a cheaper price 
anywhere else but at Costco. If you want five pounds of something, rice, you might get it cheaper somewhere else, but no one will sell you cheaper 20 pounds uh, rice bag than what Costco sells. Yeah, they stand behind what they sell, has a good refund policy, that's true. <clears throat> So that's on, on Costco. Price rise since Jan 2021, maybe 60% possible, but probably still cheaper than the rest. All right, uh, today is like, a, you know, we are wandering investors. We can go through any different topics. So I have a topics I'm a very, uh, you know, no, no, no specific format that generally I use. So that it will go me jumping from one place to another. So, so keep me honest. You know, pull me if I go too off the rails. Okay. Uh, Vivek. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been complaining a lot for the last two years. You know. Why I mentioned uh, the Muni office being closed is because, you know, um, America doesn't act like it wants to be the best. You know, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's just, you know, it's, I mean, like, for instance, China, you know that you're helping them build their, uh, their, their, uh, technological advances, you know, with the surveillance economy and people just accept it, you know, and here people say, oh, we're best in that and best in this, but I had a really bad uh, medical, uh, well, like three instances last year and the U.S. doesn't act the best and neither is it very, uh, um, you know, one reason why it's probably still the biggest economy, I mean, I kind of agree. This, this was also a topic that uh, everyone else able to hear me? Something on Zoom or? Can I get? Okay. 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 Yeah, I kind of agree. And Sam, I'm not sure if you're able to hear me or not. Uh, but uh, um, I do feel. U.S. has become more and more complacent, especially, you know, it, and we were actually talking about our friends yesterday. I'm like, I have a team in in China, team in India, of course, team in U.S. And I see my team members in China and, and India be more hungry for work and more, you know, enthusiastic to pick up any new stuff or new work that comes in, then I see, you know, my team members in US. So I'm like, then if that's the case, why would I not have more work get done from the folks who are more eager to do the work than in, in China and in India than doing it here? It's, I do see complacency set, setting in and uh, like it or not, for me, I got, I've, I've got to do the, I have to get the job done. Because if you don't do it here, and uh, unfortunately, I'll have to, you know, get it done from, from the team uh, in, in other locations. And so, uh, to, in July, we had to do, a, a, you know, restructuring. I'll use the word what uh, those consultants will use restructure your business, which in plain terms, mainly have to let some people go. And uh, I didn't fill up the positions back in US. I'm like, guys, I don't see, you know, why I, I don't see some of the folks out here eager to do that work. I might get it done from, uh, you know, from other locations. And we are running, uh, you know, late night shift out of India and still able to do the work. So, so I do see, and this is not just my my experience. Yesterday, like I said, we had some friends coming in and, and you know, they're also were showing similar sentiment in terms of 
that on the US colleagues are not working as hard as some of their other you know international colleagues it's a sad truth but you know we are seeing that uh sp why do we need to buy stocks you can trade options sell collect premium if you have many different trading option a good chance of making stocks or making more returns um if you're a david if you want dividends options won't give you dividends that's one reason why you would want to buy stock uh if you want to get dividends because you don't uh, you're not entitled to dividends if you're buying if you're in option other than that if you are on options and uh, then your options expire at a particular time so then you'll have to continuously roll and make sure you still maintain your position now depending on how active what person is it may be too much of a work for someone to continuously roll the option positions or hold the option positions to um um to simulate your stock right you're right you can simulate 100% of stock movement just using options but uh, then you have to make sure you know you you continuously uh, keep that option trade open um sp has a comment you can consider the premium itself as a dividend so i would rather do both so i hold stocks and then i also continuously uh, do options on it and um for me that's been working out working out good is stock plus options i have done for some i also did let's say synthetic stock position where you want to uh, have more uh, you know use little less capital right but again that's little more of a work now depending on how much time you may have you may want to do uh, you know either 100% options or uh, stock and option combination uh, for me i think i feel more i am very much comfortable with stock and option combination uh, given the amount of time i can spend on doing options uh futures i haven't tried uh steve the gen z here only want to play video games yeah and asking them to do anything you know new it's like i have to ask favors right uh the people in india china are hungry and gen z here are for that's true yep <clears throat> okay uh, uh other thing i want to talk about the cognitive biases right we as a investors are all human in when you're human you're also subject to emotions however hard we may try to be unemotional about our investing but uh, it's it's impossible and uh, then there are some biases because of those emotions which are inherent uh, in us so we have to specifically watch out for and see if i'm making this decision am i making this decision because of any of these biases so there are four biases i want to talk about it's important to be aware of those biases so that if i'm taking a, an action and think through these then i can say okay what's the, any other reason why i want to make this investment or get out of this investment you know so first is action bias uh any thought what is this action bias and this is something which i uh, have to work hard because uh, once i got you know doing options is actually moving me you know uh, making me more prone to fall to this action bias any guesses what is action bias means right so okay so so action bias is 
and we all are human and we we feel good uh, you know and, and i think we think that um, to to do you have to always do something right? you can't sit idle we we have to do and tinker with our investment right on a very regular basis oh markets moved up i need to do so i may have to sell something or i may have to buy something i may have to take an action right it's the action that will determine uh, the result but in some cases on investment sometimes you just have to wait and watch it may not have to do any action yeah. especially on the option side i am uh, prone to this action bias right uh, it is um, I'm trying to reduce and, and and see why do I need to panic or why do I need to take an action right now if the market has moved a few percent here or there, right? Unless it's a part of my regular strategy, hey, hey hold on, hold on, take a deep breath and things will be still be okay. Right? Uh, those who are active uh, in the market means who, a person like me, maybe few of like few of you, who want to see what's happening in the market, what's happening in the economy. We are very much uh, prone to fall to this, uh, this bias is, I think I have to do something. And then, you know, th so be aware why you're doing is, is it something has changed? Is it a part of your, the strategy that you already started with or something today has happened in the market that's uh, that's making you feel that you, you need to take an action? Sometimes the best invest, like there's a quote, right? The best portfolios are of uh, dead investors because <laughs> dead people can't take any action. And then their portfolio is, has multiplied because they never took any actions uh, to, to, to sell anything. Uh, <clears throat> the other one is anchor bias. Right? We anchor a price, and this is most related to a price, is you anchor a price in your mind, and that becomes the price under, you know, below which you won't sell. If you had bought a stock at 10 and now you anchored the value or the fair price of the stock at 10. Now the stock it is, is eight, six is going down. And if you think the it is difficult to, to sell because we have anchored in our mind that particular price. Stock market doesn't know anything about what price you bought or what price you sell. Or if you have sold a stock at $100, now that price is anchored in our mind. It becomes very, very difficult to buy the stock if the stock goes up to, you know, 120 bucks, 130 bucks. Maybe a stock is going up because the future is bright for the company. But then we are kind of a, um, we are out of that particular stock and stay out because of this anchoring bias. So this is a very difficult bias to fight uh, with. And uh, that's one reason why I generally don't sell stocks unless the business has, has changed a lot and my thesis has changed. I generally don't sell stock because the stock has gone up 15% in a month. Unless my when I invested in the stock, my thesis itself was, Oh, this is a short time. It's going to, you know, if it goes up 15, 20 percent, I'm going to take a profit and quit. Because if you sell once, it becomes difficult to to get back into that stock uh, at a higher price. Because whether you like it or not, it, you know, unintentionally, subconsciously, I'm telling myself, what a fool I am. I sold it at 100, and now I'm trying to buy 120. You know, no one wants to do that. So, so that's an anchor bias. Third bias is a sunk cost bias. I think we already did it. This is where we call throwing good money after bad. Right? Uh, if I've already, if I'm already invested in a stock, you know, I probably 
what do you call double down if it goes down reduce my uh, cost basis by be, by buying it at lower and lower price if you're buying it at lower and lower price because the business is still strong great that's that's called averaging out but if you're buying it lower and lower price because I've already invested 10K in it. Now the stock is cut into half. Or let me put another 2K and it will bring down my average buying price by a lot. So that becomes, that. that's a sunk cost. And lastly is a confirmation bias. This is the, the echo chamber, you may call it. Is a, you're trying to seek or information which reinforces the thought that you already have around that particular stock. If you're bullish about a stock, you'll probably end up reading all the articles that talk, you know, that glorify that stock and, and talk about how great the stock is. And uh, uh, because it, uh, it confirms the thesis that I already have, that it, it is important to, to, to understand the conflicting view. So one way to avoid this is if you're bullish on a stock, also list down a bearish thesis for the stock. It is a, it's a hard uh, work to do, but it helps us to avoid this bias is, and I would say if you, if you're bullish as a investor on a particular stock and you don't have a bearish thesis, it means we haven't even done our homework correctly. Um, to, to avoid this whole confirmation bias, it, it, it is important to, to look at both sides of the coin and seek out, or maybe sometimes actively seek out who are the bears on this particular stock? What are they saying? Again, it's a long journey. Won't happen in a day or two. It will take a years of practice to, to free ourselves from these biases. First of all, be aware of these biases and then figure out, you know, okay, how do I come out of these biases? Uh, Steve says, quit your unhappy job, divorce your lazy wife, sell your lost stock, and take sunken cost. The key to avoid anchor bias is to put the anchor low enough. Yeah, anchor bias comes on both on buying and selling. I think the key is to first recognize that my my action is being driven by some of, by some of these biases and not by um, you know a, a, a thesis on on this particular stuff anyway what else uh, 10 some rules for financial success i think we have this any we have seen this enough but I, what i'm more interested is what else right so a few rules that let's see here, pay off your debt, budget your expenses, invest in yourself, uh, say invest in yourself, is learn about things. It, gathering knowledge is the best investment. It will pay off, not today, not tomorrow. It will pay off. Sometimes you won't even realize how it will pay off, but uh, learning and lifelong learning is, is the best investment that you can ever do. Uh, focus on mental health. Health is important. No investment is worthy of losing your sleep or losing your health. I don't care. It's a 10x, 100x. But if you're losing sleep on it, then it's not really worth it. Uh, create multiple income streams. And this is nothing but a diversification. Invest greater than 10% of your income. I would say invest anything which is disposable income, you know, which you don't need it in next three to five years. That could be that could go as uh, investment. Uh, read. This is the art that we are losing. Um, 
because our 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 life has become so busier that uh, we don't have time to read anything but scientifically uh, we understand un, and retain so the things that we read more than the things that we uh, listen to so podcasts are great but uh, reading is important because when you're reading through it and especially actively reading through it you are able to read in a lot more uh, cut unnecessary expenses uh, i don't have i think you all know what that means avoid lifestyle uh, lifestyle creep uh, lifestyle creep means okay today i'm happy with two bedroom that you know fits me but then i realize oh my friend bought three bedroom house now suddenly i feel bad about my lifestyle now i need to have a three bedroom or i bought a car and my friend I, my friend bought you know a car more expensive than me or a better version of that car now suddenly i would have been exactly keeping up with the joneses I, i was perfectly happy and now i have to upgrade my lifestyle because someone else has done better than me uh and uh, think on long term but when it comes to investing it's always long term uh what are the rules these are not the only ones uh, what a few rules that we can use to to be a successful investor so i think uh, of course a couple of them we discussed in a, doing the cognitive biases avoid echo chambers uh, be humble so for me uh, the best lesson that i have learned is uh, don't be deterministic that uh, you know be comfortable in the probabilities in life as well as in invest in investing actually maybe in some other session will so there is a professor in stanford um who gave who have a different way of scoring the 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 paper which is more about a probabilistic way of scoring the paper uh one I'll, i'll bring up that uh, article i read somewhere is you know if you are you you if you're giving an answer you actually pro- attach a probability to that answer i think this answer is 80% correct or 100% correct right and then he has a rubric on how to grade you and that's the best way because everything most of the things in the life are probabilistic there is nothing deterministic and what i learned in my investing is be okay <clears throat> for investing in a probabilistic manner right yeah i'm bullish on this but i think still okay if stock could go down 5% 10% right? that's where that's why i started loving option because it could help me be a probabilistic investor if i was just on a stock uh it it is a deterministic right you put a line in the sand which i hate putting a line in the sand <clears throat> what else what are the other rules uh see a question from sp can you talk about tax loss harvesting sure <clears throat> and uh, when it comes to december so first let's talk about tax loss harvesting as the name suggests we actually take a loss in our we deliver so tax loss harvesting uh, refers to a process of deliberately taking a loss on your portfolio on your stock to reduce your tax burden so for example uh if you had uh, you know sold some stock or had some capital gain say of 1000 1000 let's put $10000 you got to pay your capital gains tax on this $10000 but now you're also holding some other stock that you didn't sell and uh, those stocks have fallen down a lot and now those stock are in loss it is difficult for us to, you know to to sell 
uh, at a loss because I tell you know I'm a fool, and I, I made a loss. But you could be uh, more uh, diligent about it in terms of saying if I if I have this ten thousand dollar worth of a gain and I have to pay a tax depending on what our tax bracket, let's say it's 25%, $2,500 goes to the government, goes to the IRS, right? And now I have another stock which is in loss. I can sell that stock at a loss and reduce my uh, taxable amount. So if you say sell another stock and uh, take a loss of $10,000, Right, so you you have a zero taxable capital gains now. Now the stock that you have sold for ten thousand dollars, you probably are you were holding in it because hey you want to um, hold it for a long term. But right now you're taking the loss. Then you have to wait for thirty days plus to buy back the same stock. So we see these. Uh, lot of uh, institutional investors, mutual funds, waiting until the last few months to figure out now to re reduce the tax liability is, can I do some tax loss harvesting in you know November, December? Uh, you know, in, in that case, and this is one, they say on one side we have a Santa Claus rally, on the other side, something which can pull the market down is a tax loss harvesting is some of these funds, retail investors, maybe selling some of the stocks that they thought maybe it will recover. I'm holding it. It's down. It might recover now. Now I'm reaching the end of the year. Oh, it's not recovering. Okay. While it's down, let me reduce my taxable liability by taking a loss on the stock and having it adjusted with the other capital gains that I had. And uh, I'm bullish on it, so I'll buy it after 30 days anyway. I'll buy it back. Right? So if you buy it before the 30 days, then it becomes a wash sale. You can't take that loss. So you buy it back after 30 days and uh, do a tax loss harvesting. So that process is called tax loss harvesting. Uh, there are, I think, Wealthfront or Betterment, uh, those robo-advisors, some of them, they actually promote tax loss harvesting as a, one of the feature saying, so, you know, we'll help you to reduce your, or your taxable liabilities by actively, you know, harvesting uh, the loss to reduce your tax taxable uh, tax liabilities. Uh, so don't invest mutual fund in the last quarter, you pay short term uh, capital, uh, you pay tax short term capital gains. Uh, if only the mutual fund has gone up, <laughs> otherwise there may not be any gains on it. I start planning in October before other investors bring it down. Yeah, further December is to buy back, keeping track of uh, war sale. Yeah. So I'm not too too good at uh, at keeping track of the of the war sales, but at least at least for this year, I was very particular about uh, making sure. Um, to, to focus on my taxable liability. So I did uh, uh, do, I, I did a tax law harvesting. I've been doing it from, a, let's say from a beginner, I think from a June or July. I started looking at every month, what do I see my realized uh, gains slash losses on my different accounts? And if it is showing on a profits, I want to see, is there a somewhere where I can take loss, right? So I had some, the uh, you know, long by when I started, I had my some of my stocks in you know, Wells Fargo advisors. Those were the days when Wells Fargo used to give me hundred free trades for a year, and that was like more than enough. And Scott Trade used to charge seven bucks. That was the cheapest one. So I had a Wells Fargo advisors account. I'm like, uh, those shares were all like they're like double in amount. And 3x in amount, I'm like, if I sell those now because I want to consolidate. So this year it was good. I sold, cleaned up that portfolio. I sold most of it. 
and uh, those were all profits. So I took did a tax loss harvesting on some of the newer purchases that I did to reduce the uh, taxable liability for this year. So that's that process is called tax loss harvesting SP. I don't know if we were looking for something else, uh, but generally we will see in November, December, a lot of institution funds will start to do tax loss harvesting. And uh, that's a force that also brings down the market. So it's always Santa Claus rally versus tax loss harvesting, who wins? And uh, that determines where the market goes in the last in December. Okay. Yeah, because if you have more losses, uh, you know, you can only carry forward again three thousand dollars of capital loss. Okay. Uh, oh, that's some fun short ETF idea. Is uh, the next Warren Buffet is a short ETF? We will see who is the next Buffett. Uh, Sam Bankman Fried, King of Spec, Baby Buffett, William Ackman, uh, Eddie Lampert, uh, was uh, famous for Sears. <clears throat> Whenever you see on the business week the next Warren Buffet, I think that's a idea for shorting the stock. Again, no financial advice. A little bit fun. Uh, there was this is also called, I think, in a, it's called the curse of uh, time. I think there's a because uh, it's also related that if folks have been on the cover of a Time magazine, it's uh, time to short that stock because of of time. Yeah, uh, something similar to that. Second, okay. Oh, this one too. Oh, hold on. The curse of time makes in covers. Is this? Anyway, I'll find out. There was there's some article around. Uh, it's actually got a name. <laughs> and if you're on the magazine cover, uh, it is, uh, you know, those companies then tend to do worse after they have been on one of these magazine covers. So it's called the curse. Uh, you can only take 3,000 loss for a year. You can carry the remaining loss for future years. Yes. So in, in a particular year, you can only take 3,000. So it means you have a 10,000 profit, probably you can sell some stuff at $13,000 loss. If you sell more than that, you can't take more losses and uh, to reduce your tax liability. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one I put in because I, I... Uh, this week, uh, we saw Bob Iger coming back into Disney. So that reminded me, earlier this year, we talked about Bob Chapek and why, you know, I became a little bearish on Disney, on stuff happening with Chapek. So then I went back and looked into this. This was a March 26th uh, Saturday discussion, oh, which is exactly eight months ago but today is november 26 so this was march 26 where we looked at bob versus bob it was bob Iger versus bob chapek what chapek is doing by consolidating power at the center and then we had he had a tussle with the artist college johansson and you know few other stuff and that time we talked about is mickey losing its mojo uh, looks like probably we were thinking in the right way because uh, now eventually board of director also thought that Mickey was losing its mojo and they brought back Bob Iger. What's your thought? Who? I mean, I I feel bad for Bob Chapek and I think the worst 
uh, player in this whole episode is not Bob Chapek, but it's a board of directors. Uh, the, the, the Bob Chapek only became CEO of, of Disney just before pandemic. And he was all executing the strategy that was set with Bob Iger. In June or July, board of directors reaffirmed their faith in Bob Chapek and renewed his contract for three years. And now a quarter later, they booted him, booted him out. Come on. As, as a board of directors, you need to think a long, little longer than just a quarter, right? Uh, and um, I think it's, it's a board of directors. They should be losing the job uh, in terms of, you know, if you can't put a right CEO or can't give a backing to the CEO in the way so that he can execute what he wants to. You haven't even given him time to show what he can do. You know, I agree. He had his own episodes of, you know, these the stuff that we talked about in March, but still, you gotta give him some time. So uh, great that Bob Iger has been a, he was a great CEO for 15 years, but I think one area where he has failed is his succession planning, which board of directors and the CEO uh, should be focused on because you can't, he's not gonna live forever. The company will have to succeed even, you know, will be around even after Bob Iger has, has left this uh, uh, planet Earth. Uh, but that's one area where they have failed miserably is to put together a nice succession plan because every time they, now they've gone back to Bob Iger. And all Chapek was doing was to, he was just executing the strategy that was put forth. And uh, if I recall correctly, I think Bob Iger never let him do his job the right way because he was still there commenting about what Chapek is doing. So we'll see. <clears throat> For now, Disney shareholders were happy because they got back the, the CEO uh, who had done wonderfully good for over 15 years before he hung up his boots. And uh, Chapek was the chosen one. I mean, he... Bob Iger chose Chapek. He was the chosen one. But anyway, we'll see. Uh, Samson, there was a BS video calling Iger treated and a founder mindset. So that just tell me, you know, could we see the same thing with Jeff Bezos? You know, let uh, Andy Jesse take the fall because now Amazon is firing uh, all these workers. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, so Jeff Bezos was there while Amazon has its heydays, enjoyed while Amazon was going up. Now the tough times are falling in. Got Andy Jesse. He sold a lot of his stocks before the, you know, 2022, made tons of his money and now brought back Andy Jesse. Now Andy is doing the tough job of trying to navigate the company through these high interest uh, rates. And they already have, uh, you know, they've already told media they're going to fire 10,000 uh, employees. And and he told that even in 2023, more firing is not, uh, you know, not out of the books. So there will be continuous reduction of uh, forces, um, of workforce in 2023. So will we see Jeff Bezos coming back and replacing Andy Jesse? Who knows? Uh, we've seen Starbucks. Right? Sometimes these storied CEOs slash founder CEOs. Okay, Starbucks, Hoshuls were not really, really the founder, but almost the founder. Uh, sometimes it's difficult for them to give away that power. Now, Howard Schultz is coming back. He, he came back like the third time to become a CEO. Uh, now they appointed a uh, new person. We'll see how long that does that new person last. Succession failure, G. Jack Welch uh, and Dell Michael Dell. Yeah. 
G was, I think, uh, it G used to be the most admired company in the world, and used to be the the most the the largest market cap on Dow Jones. But now it's not even there in Dow Jones. I mean, Jack Welch was famous throughout the world for his management practices and and his books. Yahoo Tim Kugel. I don't know Tim, uh, eBay Meg Whitman. Yeah, so I mean, if you're Disney shareholders for now, you should be happy, but I think there's a lot of work to be done long term. The fact that they can't live without Iger doesn't sound, doesn't bode good for Disney for long, uh, uh, you know, as a company. Uh, <clears throat> what else? Uh, Another interesting chart that I saw was uh, around financial shenanigans, right? The vicious circle of accounting fraud. A CEOs make lofty predictions, spreads undue optimism, corrodes managers' behavior. They make up the numbers that has a snowball effect. Now you have to, you know, do the higher again do more lofty predictions. Why good people do bad things? Number one, social proof. Others are doing it too. Why should I be left behind? Everyone is stealing. So it is acceptable behavior. Let's do that. Slow contrast, right? Gradually changes. Make 1% change here, 2% change here. Now, there's a famous saying. Uh, it says, CFOs can tell their CEO, tell me what number you want and I'll, and I'll give you that number. Tony always think that why, when the companies announce a result, why they always end up so close to, uh, now most of the time they end up very close to the investor, uh, you know, the Wall Street expectations, the analyst expectations. Yeah. They're pretty close to analyst expectations. Is it slightly exceeding or slightly down? How come they always get back to that number? There are ways to in accounting to do all the shenanigans. Uh, third one is commitment and consistency. If you have done it once, you can't go back. It, uh, then incentive caused by said this will make us rich. So be careful for many of these accounting frauds that we see. Uh, they'll have one or one of these elements. So you should watch out for firms under pressure to maintain high growth, uh, which is probably all the firms needing big capital to grow, which is very important. If and I would add uh, excessive stock-based compensation, which is where some of these uh, uh, some of the companies that we talked about fall under is a uh, huge stock-based compensation because. Probably they're not making real money. Is the only way to pay employees is through the stock. Firms are making a lot of acquisitions. Uh, again, it is important if you see a growth, a revenue growth, is it an organic growth or is it an inorganic growth? I know of a company that have made 16 acquisitions so far. And I'm like, what? The? And that's run by a person I know we work together. So I've been following his trajectory. I mean, what the heck is he up to? I don't know if I should be happy about my friend or it gives me a sign of trouble because most of his growth is all through acquisitions. Yeah, uh, yeah firms needing big capital to grow, stock-based compensation. And uh, finally, IPOs. Is a company going IPO because they have to or because they want to? There's a big difference on whether you want to or whether you have to. So that was an interesting chart I saw, or I'll share. And the uh, last one is around uh, Apple. So earlier we were talking about Apple, right? And uh, this one again <clears throat> came from Apple becoming advertising giant. So as we all know, Apple implemented the 
new feature in their uh, latest OS of ask apps not to track because Apple has been champion of uh, you know user privacy. And uh, if you wish for that Facebook should not track you, what do you do on other applications? Yeah, they'll block Facebook from doing that. They'll block Snap from knowing what the heck you did on Apple on iTunes, right? What did you do on, on some other applications, right? And uh, we saw the result of that. Facebook or now it's called Meta taking a uh, hit of whatever, $10 billion plus uh, in the revenue because of these changes. And uh, it has caused a lot of uh, um, issues across all the companies that were dependent on advertising as a revenue. So saw something interesting, which is for Apple, for years, Apple has watched Google and Meta make billions by collecting every scrap of people data and target them with ads. Now it appears it was just taking notes. Apple advertising operation follows a surveillance capitalism model of its rivals using data it collects from various Apple services on your Apple account to show you the ads in, in App Store as well as in news and stock apps. Notably, these are all platforms or services that Apple has con complete control, allowing it to lock out its competitors. Yeah. Apple currently brings around $4 billion from advertising and it forecasted to bring $30 billion. I couldn't find any good proof of it. So I will kind of a discount this one, $30 billion. But four billion dollar of from ad is that is true. While these are way smaller than what Google brings, it represents a change in philosophy. Uh, Apple earned only three hundred million dollar in ads in two thousand seventeen. So from three hundred million dollars in five years, they are almost more than ten times, right? uh, thirteen times from three hundred million dollar to four billion dollar in five years. Uh, the new emphasis on advertising also undermines the app and claims about privacy with this app tracking transparency. And it's, uh, sorry, ATT feature and it's privacy. That's iPhone ad campaign is, we won't let you track, you know, we, we care about your privacy. But it appears that the ATT may have been more about blocking competitors than protecting users' privacy. Hey, we won't let Meta, we won't let Google, we won't let Snap know what you were doing. Uh, but yeah, as an Apple, I'll know. Since Apple introduced ATT, its ad revenue has skyrocketed and leading German regulators to figure out if Apple is abusing its power in you know as power as an app platform to show up their advertising business okay. an interesting one we never talked about apple as an advertising business we talked about amazon amazon is bringing what 30 billion dollar a 20 billion dollar this year in advertising which, which didn't even exist a few years ago. Now it's Apple having cut off a lot of others from getting a precise information about users, but Apple still have all that information. So it will be interesting to see. So I don't want to discount Apple uh, for now, uh, given the fact that they also had filed recently patents for their AR, VR and all that. So who knows? If nothing else, they, their balance sheet is so strong, they can continue to buy back the shares. And uh, the stock might still, even though revenue may not increase, the stock price might still be too good in the long term. Who knows? But uh, an interesting thought around maybe a new business uh, unit for Apple is advertising.
All right, anything else, any questions? We hit our uh, two hour mark. So I'll probably stop here. Uh, we can cover some of the other topics uh, in some other sessions, but I feel good to talk something completely different, right? We going in all the directions of the rails. Uh, hopefully I was not too way off, <laughs> but if I was, apologies, we should do this. Maybe I'll use this Thanksgiving episodes just to have some fun. We all need to have fun as well. Uh, Chintan, how are you planning a 401k for the next year? 60-40 won't work. My sense is best to be 100% bonds for the beginning of the year. Which bond funds to buy though? So on my 401k, uh, <clears throat> I am one, I mean this, this uh, 100% in my 401k, I goes to SBY 500. I had my IRA where I have a lot of individual stocks, uh, which I was dabbling, but now I've decided that slowly and steadily when it comes to the retirement account, I just want to keep all the retirement account in two or three ETFs. That's it. And then I will use uh, the my other options, trading accounts, et cetera, to do the hedge trades. So my plan for 401k is still be the same today. All my 401k just go straight away in uh, the equivalent of uh, SPY. Um, well, I forgot whatever. So we have our plan from uh, Trans America, and there is something under that which is equivalent of uh, S and P 500. So all my 401k goes in over there. So that's why SP S&P 500 is my biggest position. Uh, <clears throat> bonds, it's a, it's a good time. I, I would say, again, not a financial advice, but it's a good time to, to buy bonds because if the interest rates eventually will go down, if they are expected to go down, the bonds prices will go higher. So the bonds, say if you buy the bonds now, those prices will go higher. If I were to play in bonds, my only play in bonds is, a, is a, uh, or I would say rather two plays. One is on the option side, it is TLT. The ticker symbol TLT, this is, a, is an ETF uh, with a 20 year maturity bonds. Yeah, 20 year uh, maturity bonds. Ever since the interest rate started to increase, there's a fallen down. And now if, uh, interest rates start to decrease, the bond prices will go higher. I TLD, I use it because it's uh, optionable and uh, it's a pretty liquid. Uh, but then again, I use it in my options account um, to, to basically, you know, do options on it or hold some TLD and then do options additionally on top of it. Uh, Bob says go Roth. Yes, I have also, in fact, my current one is a 401k, I have it in Roth. So I have traditional 401k IRA, my current 401k with my new company, which is like 15 months. Uh, I did Roth because I do want to do a combination of Roth and uh, and the traditional one. <clears throat> My spouse's is all uh, traditional 401k. Yeah, so I had enough, you know, uh, enough of uh, sugar rest on the 401k account. Uh, so my plan is to keep just the retirement account in very few uh, takers mostly ETF or if we were to pick up individual stock. Currently we have an Apple, Microsoft, I have a Berkshire Hathaway, I have a Boeing, uh, it's been like cut into half, uh, plus, you know, some, some growth stocks. So I just need to clean that up and keep a retirement account uh, much simpler and use my options account to basically hedge uh, the retirement portfolio. Yeah, so 
the four one kilo all, all going into SPY. Cool. All righty. Uh, what else? Any other interesting things? You saw <clears throat> in the markets. Is there a way to lock in about 8% yearly return when the 10 year treasury is at 5%? Um, I don't know if there were, if there were to get a guaranteed 8%, it will be quickly arbitrage. I mean, uh, at least I'm not aware of uh, where you can lock in. I mean, there may be some of these uh, 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 company bonds, right? You have, might have some company bonds uh, wherein, uh, you they might offer eight percent, but then you run the risk of uh, of you know the default from the company. So that risk is there. SP says some annuities, uh, uh, yeah, risk. As we say, some annuities may do that. So if that, I'm not sure if they are guarantee of eight percent. SP. We're doing trying to guarantee anything beyond the treasury rate. It means you'll have to take some risk. The only risk free, so called risk free, that is also not risk free. Treasury is not risk free. Uh, mm -hmm. The the only risk, the, the best creditor uh, is or is is. Um, The best debtor is treasury, right? Yeah. They will not default, and that's the safest instrument. Eight percent assumption, most pension funds. That's why pension funds are moving. You know, that's what we saw. What happened with the pension funds in UK because they had other investments. That's where we see pension funds trying to get into the VC and uh, um, and, and hand over money to VCs so that they can get their eight percent. And now, at least if with the treasury, they can make 5%. And that's why, you know, the big money is moved into treasury. We see what's happening in the stock market. And now, the only delta that they have to worry about is another 3%. Prior to that, that delta was much higher. So a lot of pension funds money was invested in the stock market. Yeah, we'll be interested to see if annuities, because generally annuities over a long term don't offer great returns. Uh, if, but it, it's a great it, it's a great convenience of having steady returns. All righty, uh, no other questions, no other thoughts, then uh, let's end the session here. We'll be back with our regular agenda from uh, next week. Uh, enjoy your long weekend. I appreciate you guys spending like almost two hours on this on this long weekend. So really appreciate that. And, uh, and going through, you know, all different topics. So have fun. Uh, stay safe. Uh, go and maybe shop something. Let's give a boost to this economy. All right, guys. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll talk again next week with a variety of topics, seeing what's happening in the market with the, our regular agenda from next week onwards. Cool. Bye bye.